Good afternoon. Uh, this afternoon is our uh, second webinar, which is essentially presented by Stephen Mackey on corporate bonds. This follows our earlier discussion we had with Morningstar Investment Management on uh, equities. Uh, so this is a welcome change, perhaps. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Stephen Mackey to talk about corporate bonds in this current environment. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Murray. So, Murray, I, I thought I'd start I'd, with a bit of a look at the history. I've put a paper together uh, that I've sort of published out on LinkedIn and sent to our clients and happy to share with your clients as well. But, but really, the, the only thing that we can go on with this event is history. Uh, so I had a look at what uh, what happened in some of the major, you know, the major, we call them flight to quality risk off events, you know, over the past 20 years to see if there's any parallels. and. Obviously, you know, the September 11 tax and, and the GFC instantly spring to mind. But, but there was actually a, a pandemic um, that was the swine flu, and that occurred in 2009. Uh, now, how the market reacted to that was, was very different to what we've seen today. So, you know, as, as bond investors, we're, we're sort of conscious of what happens to the entire capital interest capital structure. So obviously, you know, if a company's equity is not doing too well, then you know, that can affect their bonds as well. But, but really, it was, it was just to kind of gauge some sort of guess as to when normality would return to the market. So uh, it's it's been a pretty fast moving weekend. We've seen case numbers jump by about 40,000 over the weekend. Uh, this is the biggest single jump in coronavirus cases that we've seen. Uh, and similar to what happened in China around about 13th of February. So obviously the market hasn't liked what it's seen over the weekend. Uh, the Fed has done unprecedented measures uh, by cutting twice intra-meeting. And again, they really only do this when there is a crisis. So by all means, this is uh, it is a crisis, but I'd be first to point out that this is a medical crisis. Uh, that if it's not contained quickly, can spill over into the economy. So, so governments are doing as much as they can. I think that's what they're there for. They're there for, to, you know, take our taxes off us and then provide us with uh, services such as defence and health. And this is really when uh, governments will be judged going forward. But in this paper, Murray, it's, the swine flu is very different to the corona flu, um, to the coronavirus. Uh, you know, the coronavirus is a lot more contagious uh, than swine flu was. And really, swine flu was a, it was a young person's illness that, that really broke out in Mexico uh, and affected young people, whereas the coronavirus, as we've seen, tends to be more, more fatal to, to older people and those with respiratory illnesses. But um, if you have a look at that first chart we've got there on the webinar, um, I've just done the extrapolation function in Excel just to, to try and get an idea of how the the actual cases uh, could track, which is a straight line for the coronavirus uh, relative to the swine flu. So in terms of the quantum of numbers, um, you know, the coronavirus is obviously following a similar, similar case, uh, case load as we saw in 2009. So the, the big difference with coronavirus, and I think the response we've seen from government, um, is really the death rate. And, you know, I'm, I'm no medical expert, but, you know, I can look at numbers and the numbers of this thing, uh, obviously, uh, it's a lot more infectious and it's a lot more lethal early on in the piece, which that second chart uh, really demonstrates. So that, that just tells you why governments have swung into gear, why the, the, the measures we've seen, uh, you know, that many are saying are quite draconian, uh, are necessary. Uh, you know, talking to people in the US over the weekend, uh, kids have been sent home from school for a month, uh, really just to restrict that, that case growth rate, which is what we've seen. Countries like Singapore do very successfully uh, by limiting you know, the movement of their citizens. They've been able to flatten out, out that case rate uh, and just let their medical <coughs> medical staff and uh, medical services uh, recover and deal with the cases that they've got at, at hand at the moment. So look at the combined um, two pandemics. Um, you can really see that's a third chart, the death rate is probably um, quite obviously a lot higher with coronavirus. We're, we're looking at about 3.7% uh, as opposed to the, the swine flu pandemic of 09, uh, which was, you know, around about 1%. So, you know, people are asking me, you know, why, why are markets reacting? Why is it so, you know, been such a big move? You know, so as, as I've said, there's three main reasons I see. One, uh, the swine flu was less contagious and less lethal than coronavirus, hence the market has really reacted. Uh, two, the media. Uh, I think, you know, 
know, the media have got a, a lot of um, a lot of sway these days, particularly social media. Uh, you know, back in 2009, we didn't even have, I don't think Twitter was around. I'd never heard of it. Um, so, you know, and we've seen all the, the supermarket toilet paper fights that um, people, you know, sort of desperate um, for toilet paper for some reason um, that's, uh, that, that's been around. So, but, you know, more importantly, we're here to talk about the market. So, you know, the market levels between where we were in the world in April 2009 and January 2020 uh, could really not have been two, two more different. You were listening to other, um, your other managers from other asset classes, but really, you know, the equity market at the start of this year, the S&P 500, uh, in terms of absolute uh, real levels, you know, if we rebase the equity market uh, using nominal GDP, there, it was really more overvalued than it was during the dot-com bubble, uh, which, you know, if you remember that, uh, equity valuations were, were well out of hand for some time. Um, but the, the S&P was more overvalued than that with earnings. Uh, it was trading around about, you know, 23 times earnings at, at one stage in January. Uh, you know, there was a lot of good news around. Uh, the Iran thing had blown over. There was plenty of stimulus around. Trump was looking quite good. Um, you know, there are plenty of reasons for people to come out and buy equities in January, which is what they did. So, you know, let's have a look back to 2009, and we're at the tail end, but we know sort of the, the darkest days of the GFC. Uh, you know, Lehman had collapsed in 08. Uh, you know, sort of valuations on the S&P were, were, you know, down to around 13, 14 times earnings. So it really took a lot of medicine um, from Dr. Ben Bernanke to really get that US market some confidence. So, you know, what was that medicine is the question. So uh, we really saw direct intervention from federal, federal, um, the Federal Reserve at the time. Um, you know, it wasn't the first time that the Federal Reserve had intervened uh, during a crisis. Uh, they, they'd helped out in 1994 uh, during the collapse of long-term capital management. Again, they, they helped out in 98. Um, and again after the 2001, uh, the 9-11 attack. So, you know, the Fed is active in the market, as is our own Reserve Bank of Australia. Uh, but really, you know, that involves reducing rates. So that's known as monetary policy. Uh, and we've seen an aggressive reduction in uh, the cash rate. Now, as investors, we don't really borrow at that RBA cash rate. Uh, or lend at that cash rate. We, uh, we're, we're more determined by where the banks do business. And the banks, you know, typically will offer deposit rates, you know, say about 1% above where the cash rate is. But that, that's really affected um, deposit rates. They've been hit quite uh, drastically, um, which means investors are looking for other alternatives such as fixed income, uh, which, you know, will typically offer to rates 2 to 3% above the uh, three-month deposit rate. So, you know, the, the next thing is, um, is fiscal measures, which we've seen as well. We saw back in 08, uh, you know, there was extensive government subsidies. Uh, the Rudd government at the time uh, guaranteed the debt, uh, i.e. the bonds of not only the banks, but they also guaranteed the bonds of state governments, um, state governments such as Queensland. Uh, at the time, you know, we obviously had a lot of debt then, and we do now. Um, but the federal government stepped in and provided a, a Commonwealth guarantee uh, on a, a whole range of bonds. So that that helped put some confidence in the bond market, which really is the uh, is a key driver for financing of the economy. So you know, large companies and large banks typically rely on the bond market to draw down financing. So whilst they have their, their equity uh, issues, uh, a lot of their day to day and sort of year-to-year -year funding is tapped out of the bond market. So, so really getting some confidence back in the bond market is what I'd expect to see this week, uh, which is, funnily enough, what's happened today. Uh, the Reserve Bank's announced that they'll be buying bonds. They said government bonds. Uh, we don't know which government bonds, whether that includes state government bonds. Um, but it, it's definitely put some confidence back in the market. Uh, Thursday, Friday, I think the market was a little bit unsure of what was happening. Uh, but we've definitely seen a, a reaction. But um, so, you know, if we, if we swing back to, to the valuation argument with the S&P, um, you know, the reaction that we've seen in markets is quite unprecedented. You know, we've seen CBA shares go from $90 down to $60. Uh, but again, it sort of falls back to those valuations. And I've got a little chart there. This is uh, the fourth chart in the series. Just showing the, the move so far. That was up to last 
last Thursday of what we've seen um, in the S&P 500. Um, you know, pretty much I would expect it down around that 2,500 level today. Uh, but, you know, we were quite overvalued. We were, you know, up around 3,500. So we had a long way to fall uh, from a valuation context. So if we just look at that last chart, um, you know, the coronavirus peak in January, uh, we were, you know, around 21 times earnings for, for most of the period. Uh, and as I said, we got up to about 23 times earnings at one stage. So the market had priced a lot of good news in. Uh, whether or not that was warranted or not, I don't really know. But uh, but I think, you know, hopefully if earnings hold up in US companies, uh, we should be able to, you know, as a global economy, trade our way out of uh, the coronavirus. Um, if we flick back, how bad can it get is the question. Um, you know, so the swine flu started in April 2009, uh, and during this period, you know, um, the S&P 500 was trading on an earnings, earnings of around 13 times. So, you know, in terms of market confidence, uh, we're in really different places, uh, but I think that's kind of where we go to. We, we sort of head down to that sort of, um, you know, extremely, pes- we've gone from extremely optimistic market uh, to an extremely pessimistic market, which is what the bond market is telling me as well. The bond market is saying we we need some more help here. Uh, we need some central bank intervention, which is what they're delivering. Uh, I would say in this crisis, most central banks have behaved to a T. Uh, there hasn't been much reluctance to act, uh, which has been good. Uh, and I think they're communicating really well with the market, which is good. So, you know, I think, as I said at the start of this, Murray, it's, this is a medical crisis. It's, it's very sector specific. So we're, we're seeing specific sectors uh, of you know, specific issuers, their bonds get affected. So by that I mean companies like Virgin, uh, their, their bonds obviously have been uh, quite heavily affected by this, as are most of the bonds that have been issued by airlines. Uh, retailers as well, we're seeing uh, the bonds issued by David Jones, uh, you know, obviously trade um, quite heavy, but you know, again, that's an expected flow on effect from this. Uh, I think for most of our investors, Murray, though, we, we hold very good quality companies. Uh, and again, a lot of those companies, uh, some of them, uh, you know, such as the, the Royal Women's Hospital, Sydney Airports, uh, they're, they're under they're underpinned by strong assets. Yeah. Uh, have, you know, senior ranking and they're senior secured. So so we're, we're quite confident and a lot of our investors have, have been ringing in and, and, and actually thanking us and saying, look, you know, I'm, I'm watching my equities have fallen 20, 30 percent out of my bonds, and um, a lot of cases they're you know stable to have gone up. Um, yeah. But it, it, it's it's a long game, Murray, and that that's the thing. This will pass. This had a defined start, it has a defined finish, um, and I think we just need to look through that as bond investors and and uh, you know let the bonds do what they're designed to do, which is provide that income, provide that capital security. Um, and capital preservation during these uh, these crazy times that we're in at the moment. Yeah, so there's nothing on the horizon that you can see in the corporate bond market that would upset the, 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 the barrow, as it were. Um, nothing nothing that there isn't a cure for. Um, this is the thing that, um, you know, I've been through a few of these and had the grey hairs to prove it, but I'm sort of saying to some of the younger team members, everything that we're seeing now, they've cured before. So... You know, if you almost think that um, the market has immunity, it does. Uh, and central banks are effectively the pharmacists. So as, as the market goes uh, to and fro the corporate bond market we're talking about, um, the Reserve Bank, who is the ultimate pharmacist of the corporate bond market, they'll release um, medicine as and when it's required. So we saw today they put a statement out saying, look, government bonds, they didn't have a great week last week, we're going to buy them. Um, you know, they'll look at state government bonds next. And then finally, uh, before state government bonds, they'll probably look at mortgage-backed bonds, which is a sector we don't we don't look at, but that really provides confidence for the housing market. Yeah. Uh, and investors that buy bonds issued by, um, you know, uh, mortgage-backed bonds, which is a, a, another sector. And then ultimately, if they need to, by that stage, they can look at the corporate bond sector. But the, the Aussie corporate bond market is relatively small. Uh, and I would say it's relatively tightly held. Uh, so we're, we're not seeing a lot of sellers in the corporate bond market. 
um, with we're seeing prices, you know, sort of marked here and there, reflective of the of the nervousness in the market. But we're not really seeing any investors wholesale selling at this point in time. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's more a, people are taking a wait and see approach. Uh, they know that there's there's more stimulus coming, uh, and and they know that that stimulus will have a reaction to the market. Yeah, so I'm hearing from this presentation that for our corporate bondholders, and there's quite a few out there, essentially um, steady as she goes, the income is still coming in, the portfolio hasn't been marked down a great deal at all, if any, if any, uh, and yep. um, essentially there's nothing to be concerned about that that's not already known in the marketplace. Exactly, not 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 for me at this stage. I mean, there's there's uh, obviously you know reluctance for people to to part with cash for any assets. Moment. I think you know if I was buying a house, I'd maybe um, want to wait it out a couple of weeks and just see how this all pans out. Um, but you know, yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing people. Um, you know, some people chose to sell a few bonds on Friday, and you know, we were able to do that quite comfortably. Um, but generally, I'd, I'd say the portfolios are doing what they were designed in this in this period to do, which is pay the coupons and, and preserve that capital. So uh, we're, we're pretty comfortable. Okay. Um, well, so I think um, that's that's probably the, the gist for today, Stephen. We appreciate you coming along. Um, any any parting comments you might want to make at this stage? Uh, yeah, I, I would just say you know it does always seem darkest before the dawn. Uh, we have seen this before, but uh, I, I think this has it, it has an end an end date to it, uh, and there could be some really good bargains out there. So. You know, it's um, you know, as longer term investors, uh, we've just got to be prepared for the speed bumps in the road, and you know, look at them as opportunities. But um, yeah, personally, I'd just say keep your distance and wash your hands. Okay, thanks, Steve. Appreciate your time today. We'll speak soon. No worries. Thanks a lot, and thanks a lot, future gen clients. Always good to chat.